All right, well today we're going to be talking about great base and stockmanship. It kind of feeds into the applied animal behavior we did and the low stress livestock handling lecture that we had. But just kind of give a little bit of background of great base and stockmanship. Um, this is kind of a, a work in progress, but it's, it's kind of what I have grown up doing and what I have been exposed to. Um, I have some of these books over here that, that we use in this class uh, in the program. The Tom Dorrance book, the the Ray Hunt book, both of the Ed Connell books. Those are kind of some some foundational books that uh, that really influenced my dad and and kind of the way we were raised and how we worked horses and and basically the way we worked horses was the was the same way that that we worked cows and setting it up to where it's their idea and applying that. And so there's some pictures down below with with me there just from from the time I was young. I was raised in that atmosphere, raised having my dad teach me and it was uh, you know starting from my grandpa and Tom and those were kind of the first guys especially my grandpa that tried to travel around and helped people understand like from a clinician standpoint and education standpoint to teach horsemanship stuff so my dad was exposed to that my my uncles were in different stuff and so that was the environment I was raised is people wanting to learn and get better and part of learning and getting better is learning from someone else, being a good student, and then being a good teacher. And I was so blessed to have the opportunity of my dad trying to be a student of that, and then as a result, turning around and teaching that, teaching us. And and my dad, he managed a big million and a quarter, million and a quarter acre ranch in Nevada that had ran 15,000 head of cows and had two full strings of buckaroos and and my dad helped he brought in Tom Dorrance to there and and he helped um, would help the cowboys they'd ride they'd go they went and showed on different uh, the Elko County Fair and it was just an environment where people were constantly wanting to learn and getting better to hone in on these different skills I'm going to talk about the horsemanship stockmanship roping teamwork and time these five different areas that I break down in stockmanship but but this is how I was raised you know dad he grew up doing all that living all that until I was probably 18 kind of through high school and then that's when dad started traveling around and taking he started doing some clinics and kind of got to figuring out he could make more doing clinics than he could and kind of enjoyed the teaching aspect of it of just starting colts and doing day work and stuff and contract colt starting and so he got to be more into the education part of it those are a couple different books that that he had wrote the cow horse confidence and the evidence-based horsemanships which are uh textbooks you know in here and and basically all of that has kind of mixed together with me passing that on to the next generation right so i got pictures of my kids there and my wife and it's it's fun for me i got my oldest son there and we went to georgia and we put on a clinic there and it's fun i got to take tail and i had tail start teaching people and two or three years ago whenever that would have been in kindergarten they asked tail what he wanted to be when he grew up and he said he wanted to be a cowboy teacher when he grew up and so it just it's funny as far as carrying on that tradition of basically this what we grew up with and so all this is his kind of uh moved to that training quality assurance which is a program designed to help trainers reach their goals that training trifecta and so that's that's basically what is great basing stockmanship i would define it as a combination between applied animal applied animal behavior and the TQA industry certification. So within a pathway certificate here at TVCC, there is the TQA industry certification, which is uh, the focus is on a certified public horse trainer. And so what I've tried to do is take what we've done as a family, my dad, how I was raised, in, in two different areas in training and selling horses for the public. Like I tell my students, there's three different areas. that six to $800 uh, per month per horse um, for training horses to the public um, and then uh, that seventy five hundred to twenty thousand dollars per horse per sale selling uh, performance horses and then day work that a hundred to hundred and fifty dollars per day so that value there could be where you're a full-time horse trainer and then you're going out and doing day work or it could be hired on a ranch somewhere where you're full-time working for a ranch you know, I, I talked about working at Simplot there where, you know, they they gave me a place to live at Simplot. They were, uh, gave me a place to live. They were feeding me at the cookhouse. I was on their insurance. 
and they were feeding four outside horses for me. They were paying me $2,000 and they were paying for me to keep four outside horses. Now I would have been charging $800 for those horses so that would have been $3,200 on top of the $2,000 I was making so that's $5,200 plus they were feeding me giving you a place to live, power, and eating at the cookhouse. So that's some pretty good money. And so that's the focus of the, the TQA industry certification is all those different areas and tying that together specifically how we work cows. Okay, We went before earlier on low stress livestock handling and that's the difference between what I would call great basin stockmanship and what's commonly taught in low stress livestock handling um, through Bud Williams and a little bit of that is low stress livestock handling has a lot to do partly in placing cows, how you handle them. The Great Basin stock mixtip, I've just basically defined that as far as what we did in the Great Basin. A big part of that is ultimately selling a horse in a performance horse sale. Okay, in training outside horses. So not that we perfect purposely stress that horse, but I see sometimes in low stress livestock handling, like they never get out of a walk. Like that's a big no no to ever get out of a walk. Where if I'm trying to sell a horse for seventy five hundred to twenty thousand dollars, I got to get out of a walk, and that's part of the production in the way the dollar value of how I handle my cows. There's an opportunity where I cannot stress the cows and I could bring the life up in my horse, bring the life up in my cow, maybe move them around and then come back down to set a foundation on that horse to go into the rodeo arena, like the stock horse showing, or I mean, and all of that tied together to go sell horses for the public. Uh, the other part of Great Basin Stockmanship, a huge part that's really heavy on my heart, is uh, the outreach of TQA. Okay, and part of that is the 4-H cult starting program that we've just kind of started this year. The high school dual credit that obviously you high school kids or people that are doing this online, you guys are part of that dual credit online class. And, and tying all that together with this sport that I've created through TQA, which really family time. That's one of the things as, as a parent and, and how I was raised, there was a lot of overlap between our family business kind of our family sport in showing horses and rodeo and, and our, our family time. A lot of that in looking back now, I mean, I really appreciate that of the family time that we spent together. And that's something that I definitely want to instill in into my kids. And so that's one of the things like as we're talking about low stress livestock handling is we're talking about um, Last week, uh, the gentleman talked about low stress livestock handling, the benefits of that. Uh, Chris, Sash Schlangler, I don't know. Chris, he'll talk next week. His starts with an S and it's got every vowel and consonant in the alphabet. Big old long name. Anyway, Chris is going to talk to you guys next week on some of the dollar value of the benefits of handling your cows different ways and how you can make money. But one of the things here is how do you put a dollar value with taking your kids out like Teo and Josie and Simon? It's hard to put a dollar value on that as a parent going and, and playing with your kids. The other part that I kind of look in there is scholarships, rodeo and stock horse. So there's an opportunity where, say, if I'm going out and I'm working my cows, whether I'm doctoring, there's opportunities, I feel like, where we're not overstressing our, our cows. And we can also instill a foundation in our kids and in our horses to go sell that horse as a performance horse sale and to give my kids skills on the ranch where they can take those skills into to get potentially a rodeo scholarship or a stock horse scholarship. I know several family ranches that their kids grew up on the ranch. They incorporated a lot of that performance horse stuff in their horses and all of those kids got scholarships because they developed those skills in a sport while they were on a ranch. And, and just to give you an example, um, I had a all my books and tuition paid for at MSU on a rodeo scholarship and that was a sixty thousand dollar education I got for free I didn't have to pay for any of that so as a parent is we're thinking about okay how am I making money how am I saving money these are I mean obviously working our cows a certain way uh, saves us money working our cows that's the big part of Great Basin stockmanship I feel like is that added bonus of riding outside horses selling horses um, in, in these other parts of part of developing skills in our kids where they can maybe go on and get a scholarship someday. And that's a big part of the 4-H program and the high school dual credit is slowing down and teaching some of these things. For me as a parent, it's been pretty fun for me going out with my kids 
And sometimes it's just stressful. You're trying to get the job done. It's like, it's stressful. You guys ever work cows? It's stressful, right? Ah! But if I can slow it down, almost like playing a sport and teach my kid and develop those skills just like basketball, you know, there's a time in playing basketball or football where you learn the fundamentals, you practice, and then you go play in the game. And that's kind of the focus for this is parents to work with their horses, work with their kids, to practice some of these skills, and then the game would be actually going and applying it when you're doing a job. And that's the big part of there is to try to eliminate some of the stress on the horses, cows, dogs, kids, wives, all of that, right? So, uh, so that's the focus of Training Quality Assurance. Um, it's a program designed to help trainers reach their goals. And we talked about the training trifecta. What's the three parts of the training trifecta? Foundation, temperament, temperament task, task completion. So those are the three different areas that in the TQA program that we are tracking to help us make money in training and selling horses. I would argue those three areas though, as far as being a good coach, being a good dad, those are the areas that I think about too with, with, with my kids as far as that training trifecta and working with people in general. And I say kids, honestly, this whole TQA program is to help employers with employees. I, I keep saying kids, it's, it's your employees, it's everyone to get them on the same page, you know. And so uh, the certified public course trainers, there's cold starting score sheets that help you make that six to $800 value. There's the sell horse score sheets, which helps you target that $7,500 to $20,000 value. And then there's the performance horse judges seats, which uh, is in the performance horse program, which all the online people, that's what we go through where we meet here, where we actually uh, participate in a sport where we're practicing all of those skills. Okay, so one of the things I like to teach in my program and is, is definitely tied together with Great Basin Stockmanship is teaching the science and the art and the business of all of these five different things. There's five different areas that we target in Great Basin Stockmanship. Horsemanship, stockmanship, roping, teamwork, time. Those are the five different areas that we test in the ranch roping competition. And everything in the entire program centers around those five different deals. And those are the areas that I feel like um, when you are missing one of those areas, that's where a lot of the wrecks start. So um, the science, breaking down the science, the art, and the business, the science, that's what I'd call the knowledge of, of why did it work or why did it not. This is the repeatable understanding of how all the fundamental pieces fit into place. And one of the big things in my program is vocab words. This started when I got my master's, when I had to name and define everything I thought I saw my dad and grandpa do growing up, give it a name and a definition. You know, whether it's with roping or horsemanship or stockmanship, let's clearly define stockmanship, clearly define flight zone balance point. And I'll just tell you a story there. Um, through this program we kind of been going through this and Teo had been learning everything my oldest and I had my horses get out and they were out you know they got out of the pen and they went out and they were eating hay and, and Teo goes running around there to go around the horses so naturally he's a dad like slow down slow down because you don't want him to chase the the horses and, and looking back he goes running way out of the flight zone he came into the balance point and he put pressure and he got him to turn. But my initial reaction was sending a kid around a bunch of spooky horses. I said, I was, Teo, Teo, slow down. And he turned around and he looked at me and he said, Dad, don't worry. I have, I have vocab words. He understood flight zone and balance point. He knew to run around there and then come right on the edge of the flight zone and then read the horse and then come right on the balance point to get him to turn. And I mean, and this was a little... I can't remember, he's like seven at that age. And so that's the focus of this program, whether it's with their horses and the 4-H program and the college program, teaching those the science behind it or the stockmanship or the roping. That's one thing I really try to help you guys is your roping, our self-image bubble gets in there, we miss, and what do we say sometimes when we miss? I suck. I suck. I'm no good, especially for I'm, the day I'm not just roping. Breaking it down, and what is the science? Why did that not work? Well, I didn't put my horse in position. I didn't. I was leading with my bottom strand, right? I bend down too much. It, my swing. I didn't get my tip going through there. And so, that, like the other day, you were roping. It's like I keep missing. Instantly, when you miss, you think I suck. When you catch, you think, oh, well, oh, I'm pretty good. You know, you feel good about yourself. Instead of really understanding the reason why I caught was that I put my horse in position. You know, I led with my top scent. The crazy part is, and I'll get into the art here. 
Sometimes if you practice enough trying to catch, you can get to where you catch actually doing it wrong. Does that kind of make sense? The guys that do it correct at extremely high level, they understand the science behind it and they knew they know how to develop the correct muscle memory so they have an extremely high percentage of catching. Okay? I'm not much of a basketball player, but I guarantee you all of the guys in the NBA have the same shot, right? Because it is a high percentage shot. Okay, that's the same with any professional, okay? All the same guys at the NFR, every one of them guys that make a living getting two feet in the loop, every one of them have the same swing delivery fault. They understand the science of what it takes to get that loop in front of that cow's feet where they can catch two feet, right? And so that's what we try to teach here. So the big thing here, someone can understand the science yet still be ineffective with livestock because they lack the practical application, the art. So we can sit down here, I can read a book, I can read the Tom Dorrance book, the Ray Hunt book, and I can become an expert in the science behind it. And a lot of people do, and then they want to, well, they've never went out and really developed the art. You know, they haven't spent the time working with hundreds and thousands of horses, applying that scientific component of talking about it to where they actually go develop the feel behind it. And there's no other way to develop the art, but by knowing this and going out there and practice, right? So you practice, and then what happens when you practice sometimes? You do, you do it right, you do it wrong, I mean, you make mistakes, so when you do it wrong, what do you do? What should you do? Keep trying. Keep trying, and what else? Okay, so I'm practicing, it didn't work, so what's a good question as you're practicing? Yeah, what did I do wrong? Go back to the science, like, instead of, ah, stupid horse. Whoa, whoa, okay, I, do I have willing submission? If I was going to give willing submission a score, if I was going to give good communication a score, I'm trying to get, where's vertical direction? <laughs> those four stages with willing submission, breaking that down, those vocab words. So the art is the hands-on practice and application, and it's essential to understand the feel and timing necessary to become an expert, whether it's with horses, roping, cows, any of that. Uh, a person may also have a lifetime of the practical application of the art, yet struggle in teaching someone the science so it can be replicated. So there's tons of people, right, especially dads that have grown up working with livestock. They naturally, by developing the art, they naturally learn flight zone and balance point because they've done it enough. But when the kid comes out there, they suck at teaching the kid, so they just put a bunch of pressure on the kid and pushes the kid up the pyramid, remember we talked about last time, to where there's a lot of pressure on that kid and it's, it's not a fun time, it's not a pleasurable time for, for anyone involved there. So the, a big focus of Great Basin stockmanship is not only understanding the science to better implement the art, but also teaching the next generation. If I'm an employer, be in a better job of teaching my employees. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Which is, that's why I call it Great Basin stockmanship because that was the environment in the Great Basin. That's what they did. There was these cowboys, whether it was my dad or Ray, or there was these teachers that were really good students that liked to learn. And, and then in an educational setting, like in Boz, I mean in, in uh, Montello, the Wine Cup Gamble Ranch, cowboys would be roping every night. They'd come together, they were constantly, they'd work full time. At the end of the day, they'd jump off and go practice showing their horses to get ready for the Elko Fair. It was just a really neat environment. And so uh, th that's a big part of that. So. Um, the business, that's being able to get, there's two parts of the business. Part of it is being able to get a job done, and that's part of it. You do these two, these two, and then at the end of the day, can you get the job done? If I'm hiring someone to do day work, bottom line, at the end of the day, they need to get the job done. That's great, they can have this theory, and they can understand the science, and they could be trying to perfect the art and do. Bottom line, at the end of the day, did you get the cow sorted? Did the job get done? And I feel like there's a disconnect sometimes between the educated people, which is science, and they think they know it all because they read a book. Some people that have been through a few clinics, whether it's a low-stress livestock handling clinic or a, or a you know, Buck Brandeman, well, I've been through the clinic, and, and they get in these clinic settings where we're practicing the art, and okay, bottom line, at the end of the day, we gotta get the job done at the ranch. Now, there is a time where we take the time to train our horses, to train the cows, in the long run, it's way better. Now, don't get me wrong, I would rather do that to take the time, sacrifice today for tomorrow to train my horses, to train my cows. But if I'm getting hired for day work and they are writing my check just because 
maybe they're not doing it the way I would do it or the way I'd been taught. At the end of the day, I'm hired to get the job done. I need to help them get the job done, even though it's not low-stress livestock handling or it's not exactly how we would do it at home. Does that make sense? One of the things I'm going to go around and I'm going to interview a bunch of people, 10 different people, with 10 different questions on day work. And that was one of them. You know what? When you're working for me, you do what I tell you to do. Okay? And don't stir up the employees being all pissed off. Okay? That's one of the things that frustrates them is do what I tell you to do because you're working for me. Okay? And so that's what we're trying to target that 100 to $150 for day work um, of being able to be adaptable to get the job done. Part of that is paying the bills. I mean, that's one of the things. These people jump out here and because they've read a book or they went to a clinic, they're instantly an expert. There's not a lot of credibility unless you've paid your bills and lived the life day in and day out. Does that kind of make sense? And so, um, anyway, that, that's, that's the other deal there. So how the science, the art, and the horsemanship of stockmanship, roping, teamwork, and time can affect the producer's pocketbook. And so uh, that, that's a big part of that. And honestly, the Great Basin stockmanship, I've grown up doing it. I want to learn a lot more about the low-stress livestock handling, like placing cows and some of that kind of stuff. But there's most of my life I've spent training a horse and working cows. I have it fine-tuned to the degree with horses that I have with specifically a group of cows, placing cows and that kind of stuff. Usually it's day work and working at, at different places. And so that's definitely an area, kind of preaching to the choir myself, that I'd like to continue to learn more in that area as well. And, and uh, I caught myself in the last video. I had no idea how much I say, does that make sense? So I'm going to try to really catch myself from saying, does that make sense? So, uh, so great pace and stockmanship. What's the five areas of great bacon, pace and stockmanship? Stockmanship. Stockmanship? Horsemanship. Horsemanship, you're cheating. Okay. Okay, the horsemanship, stockmanship, roping, teamwork, time. Okay, I'm going to break these down one at a time. But one of the things that, that I want like to say what's a little bit different in maybe great basin stockmanship than quote unquote low stress stockmanship, these same principles that I teach, I apply picking up bucking horses, which is a dead run in a very high tenseful high tense situation. Picking up I mean there's bareback riders that are hung up that are light I mean I mean it's dangerous, right? And so these same stuff that I teach, it can go from slow to low stress to extremely fast and high stress. But you can see here, here's a horse that I'm applying the same softness, the fill, the vocab words. And here I am going at a dead run, applying that same foundation to picking up a bucking horse. Here's me uh, riding a horse that I'm picking up that's soft and collected to team roping. And so that's one of the things that I'd say is a little bit different from Great Basin stockmanship to the low stress livestock handling is taking these same vocab words slow and going in an absolute dead run at extreme high intensity um, to train horses. Whoopsie daisies. Uh, so uh, in order of importance when you're working your cows, the horsemanship. So when I say horsemanship, we've already went through this vertical direction in the four stages with willing submission. So in a little bit, I'm going to break down stockmanship which is the ability to read flight zone and balance point to influence the speed and direction of an animal. How many steps does it take to influence flight zone and balance point? Um, depending if the cow or horse has a um, pretty big flight zone, you can take one step and influence them, but if they have a small flight zone, it takes a lot. You can get really close to them. Okay, other way around. If they have a small flight zone, as you're getting closer oh, there, yeah. it, it's going to be fewer steps. And if it's really, really, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so, uh, but, um, so definitely it depends. But a lot of times, I guess what I was fishing for, a lot of times it's one step. You know, uh, I take one step, I'm in it, one step, I'm out. Now, how close I am may vary, yeah. but I may be, you know, a quarter of a mile and I'm okay and I get closer and now that cow because you know it's got extremely large flight zone versus that dairy cow but it's still a lot of times one or two steps so if I want to use my horse to influence the speed and direction of that cow I need to be able to pick up on I need to be able to move his feet so what I'm saying that's why I say by order of importance horsemanship I need to be able to take one step in, in any direction so that's one of the things that we target in our program 
Personally, I think sometimes people training horses, how they train them doesn't really equip them for stockmanship because they do way too many suppling drills and they bottom their head out and they move and it's hard just to take one step, one step forward. That horse is nervous because they do so many drills instead of, and that's why in this program, I like to apply that same reigning cow horse foundation to actually doing a job where they go, okay, we're doing one step here, we're going one step here and turning and working with the cow. And that's a huge part of Great Basin Stockmanship is using our cows to train our horses where we can ultimately go take that horse and get paid for riding an outside horse or, you know, sell them at a horse sale. So, question here, how are you training horse to respond to the reins? What are the three things we're constantly teaching that horse in relation to pressure? Yeah, give to pressure, wear pressure, be resentful. So I can take the slack out, they can break in the pole, okay, they can give to the pressure, they can wear it, or they can be resentful. And a lot of times when we get on and we haven't spent time working with our horse outside of our cows and we just jump on them there and we're trying to force our horse, his body instead of influences his soul, that's where that resentment comes in. So I take the slack out of there and he roots and takes two or three more steps into the flight zone or ahead of the balance point. So now I've lost the precision in my stockmanship. And then what do a lot of ranchers do at that point? When they're trying to work cows and they're having trouble influencing flight zone and balance point on their horse. Get after their horse. Get after their horse or what's the other name? Um, they like do the traditional type of training. Like the traditional like get on the horse and like task completion. Okay, they could just kind of sacrifice the, the, yeah, do the task completion thing. I think I was fishing for a lot of times they just tie their horse to the fence. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? And that's where a lot of times instead of doing, and that's a big part of great base and stockmanship, is in, instead of driving our horses to the corral all the time, and tying our horses to the fence and stressing our cows in a corral, especially babies and stuff getting, we do it all outside in the pasture on our horses. Does that make sense? Things like holding roe deer and sorting. So I'm using my horse um, out there to use my horse and work him outside there, okay? Stockmanship. Uh, this is position the horse to influence the cow's direction in order to have a high percentage shot. So this would be in relation, I'm gonna really break down stockmanship and all the different components in a minute with some work that I've done with Chris and OSU. In relation to roping, I need to position my horse to give me a high percentage shot. So like healing, especially where we're taking these horses, we're setting a foundation, there's an insane amount of money that team ropers are paying. So for me, with young kids and young horses, and especially kids going in the rodeo arena, I like to get short and have those kids learn to put their horse's head on that left hip to get a good, straight, consistent shot. Then once they can do that and they can learn to have a good swing delivery and follow through, then if they want to get out further and throw fancy hip shots and stuff like that, I'm not against that. But first, I want them to learn to, sh to get the high percentage shot. So in heading, what would be some of the high percentage shots in, in heading if, if I was, say, doctoring or branding or that kind of stuff? What's the ones we practice in this program? The sneak loop, the money shot and the hooland. So those are some of those ones where I'm not running right straight behind that cow. I'm throwing off the side of my horse. I'm working around. Remember we're swinging twice and we're throwing those. So those are, I'm positioning my horse to influence that cow so that I have a high percentage shot. Okay, um, it's setting it up. So on roping, um, talk about swing. Okay, and I, I went through this on the score sheets. I'll just go through it real quick. We have swing, lead with the top strand. We want our tip to it, a target going over the tail head, right? Delivery, what do we want to do with our delivery? What are we thinking with our delivery? So we want our top stand with our swing, we want our top strand going over their back. Okay, get our tip through, which is 100% part of the delivery. How do we get our tip to come all the way out the other side? Yeah, we want to break the top strand on the hawk. It's the momentum of breaking the top strand on the hawk that gets the tip to come all the way through. So on our delivery, we want our tip to come all the way out the left side. Follow through. Okay, what do we think of a follow through? Um, bring your hand all the way down. Yep, bring our hand all the way down. We want to set our bottom strand down in front of the feet. Okay, so with this finger, I got my top strand. This part here, I got the tip of my loop. This, I got my bottom strand, and this is my hondu. So my hand should do exactly what I want my loop to do.
going right over his back, break the top strand over the hawk. Sometimes some of you guys stop right here, right? So that's where you guys are helping each other and you go, why did I miss? Oh, it was my delivery. Oh, it was my swing. I need a little more momentum. I need a little more momentum in my swing to get that tip to come all the way. If you're swinging and you have a good swing and you go like this and you stop and your tip's not getting all the way through, part of that could be a little more momentum in your swing and then, and I mean, momentum in your swing to come to your delivery so you can get your tip to come all the way through, okay? Uh, stop straight okay so I want to stop my horse straight when this hand comes down this hand comes up I want to stop my horse then I need to raise my hand and dally and as I'm doing that and I know this is on on horsemanship here but I really want to focus on vertical direction with stage two on my horsemanship to get that horse to pull and come back right and then the last part is dally I want my thumb up I want to keep my horse straight and uh, take three turns and slip rope so all that's um, part of that um, you know, over here I have some, some different pictures, kind of back to the Great Basin stockmanship. Um, there's a picture taking a horse from a branding and then taking them to roping in the arena. And then here's some pictures of, of Ty Van Norman. Uh, their family has been training horses for, for generations. You can see the, the generations before and then Ty, and then they, they put on their own performance horse sale. So we've been taking horses there for a lot of years, and that's. Um, horses are in high demand these horses that have come off ranches um, especially if you'll take those horses that have done the work on the ranch and then you fine-tune them in the arena through like some reigning cow horse or especially rodeo type stuff I mean that's really where we get into that ten to twenty thousand dollar twenty to fifty thousand I mean it's crazy how much they pay for some of them team roping horses and some of that kind of stuff so teamwork um, so horsemanship stockmanship you know, one of the things on teamwork I talk about is reading the same play, right? When you're on a football field, you know, I, I, sometimes I yell at you guys, read the play, pay attention to what's going on. When you're part of the team, when you understand the big picture and are getting into that, what is the big picture, and you're working together, like on a football field, it's like, hey, here's the ball, we're trying to get the ball to the end zone. And that's part of my job is I want to educate you guys a little bit more on what, it, what the ultimate goal is in working cows and in stockmanship so if you show up and you're trying to help someone in day work the person should not have to tell you everything to do you should not sit there with just a cute little smile on your face and go oh, what do I do now what do I do now what do I do now you should be reading what is going on and stepping in there and blocking the whole as far as what needs done does that kind of make sense and so that's what read the play what needs done and that's one of the things it's like when someone goes in there and they're sorting out a cow someone that has stockmanship you shouldn't necessarily have to say which one do you want. It's the one that they're influencing the flight zone and the balance point. And you guys that understand some stockmanship now, when they're coming out, you can tell that he's blocking this one. You could tell which one he's influencing. So when he's coming out and you say, which one are you trying to sort, right? You should, the one that he's asking to leave, right? That's the one that you need to open the door to let him come out, okay? Um, Okay, time, speed, regulation. I guess on that, when you are sorting, and we'll work on that. I mean, usually it's we're sorting the pairs out or we're doing, but sometimes they tell you and you're still, okay, is this, it's hard to see. Is that the neighbor's cow? What brand is that? Sometimes it's still hard to, hard to see. And so that's where it's nice to read what's going on. So speed regulation, uh, recognizing the speed in which uh, your horse has the vocab words. You can read or influence the cow and then work together with your crew to accomplish the task. This is where the performance horse series really comes in to hone in on these skills for you guys, for my kids, for the 4-H kids, for the dual credit, where we could come and practice some of this stuff. We have a lot of parents, we have a lot of adults, right? Kelsey, you've probably been around, that don't necessarily have these skills going slow at a walk, and they're trying to go really fast. And so that's the focus of the sport, is to create an environment where you can slow. I mean, it'd be no different. Did you play basketball or any sports like that? Okay, we never practice basketball. We don't practice dribbling. We don't practice passing. We don't practice getting the ball in the hoop ever. But we're just going to take our sweet little family, and we're just going to go out and enter a game with an opponent coming at us. I mean, that would be high stress, right? What's that? Full What's that? Full <laughs> Okay, uh, time. So the time component 
Here's what I call, what's a little bit different and what I call Great Basin Stockmanship. Obviously we have the speed regulation, but one of the things that is a little bit different in the Great Basin, and it is arid, there's a lot of desert type country, where a lot of times we're not placing the cows so they are scattered way out. And so when I say daylight efficiency and part of daylight, uh, Great Basin Stockmanship, is there is a time component in where you need to go fast to get the job done. You wake up early in the morning, we're constantly racing against the sun. If we fart around and we don't get out of bed, at, I mean, if we're not going to the cows at daylight, and we don't get the cows gathered, and we're not going in the direction we're going and get them lined out and done by one or two o'clock or noon, it's, I mean, in the middle of the summer, it's 103 degrees, and you're in between water holes, it could be extremely devastating. So that's one of the things I'll get to in my biggest pet fees, the 10, written, the 10 unwritten cowboy rules, is hustle. It's like being a part of a, a sports team or a, you know, a fire crew or a police. I mean, it's, there's an urgency of getting the job done. And so that's where I say daylight efficiency. And what can be confusing in the Great Basin is everything is hustle up, hustle up, horse it, let's go, let's go. You're constantly going fast and then you go to work cows and your guy's saying, slow down, slow down, slow down, you're going way too fast. If you don't know when you slow down as a new employee, it can be extremely confusing. You're just constantly getting yelled at because you're going too slow and then you're going way too fast. And so all of that is what I throw into this time. Horsemanship, stockmanship, roping, teamwork, and that time is a huge component to be able to go slow, to be able to go fast. And the other part, to be able to know when you need to go fast and when you need to slow down. Because a lot of times working cows, slower is faster in the long run. Okay, Okay. so now I'm going to jump into stockmanship and we'll talk about a little bit more breaking down the science specifically from this Chris uh, Schnangner. <laughs> He's from Oregon State. And before we looked at the foundation for perfection, we looked at applied animal behavior. Chris and I got together and we started doing some research. Uh, Chris will talk a little bit more about that research in branding calves, but he, I gave him some of the material that I had already done in working with horses in relation to the training trifecta. Chris had done quite a bit of work with uh, Steve Cody and kind of the low stress livestock handling. And it was kind of fun. We came together kind of looking from two different views of the low stress livestock handling that he was familiar with and the Great Basin stockmanship that I was raised with. And we come together and worked on this trying to define, let's leave the names out of it, trying to define what is stockmanship. So this is kind of an ongoing process that Chris and I are working on. What is the science behind stockmanship? So th this is what we came up with, okay? So uh, there, there's three different areas that we target, just like, I mean, what I teach is the training trifecta. So I'm going to go through the training trifecta and apply that to working with cows. So uh, temperament, what is the animal feeling? And when I say feeling, it's, I, I don't want to humanize an animal. That's the last thing I, I want to do there. But how do, are they responding to my presence, which is the emotions being scared or having confidence? That, that, that's why I mean by what is the, and I guess feeling wouldn't be as good as, is what emotion are they, are they explained in the temperament component? Okay, are they, do they have confidence or they do, do they have fear? And the big thing, are their actions being driven by confidence and fear? How do we know that? Breaking that down even more scientifically from what you know in the pyramid, specifically what is the science behind be having confidence and having self-preservation? What, what, remember the... the what, sympathetic so that's the question. Are they operating in their sympathetic nervous system or their parasympathetic nervous system? What happens when they're in their sympathetic nervous system? High adrenaline, high stress. When they're in their parasympathetic nervous system, they don't have the stress. Now here's the question, does that necessarily mean speed? No, a horse can lope, they could even run. A horse, cow, we could. Yeah, so sometimes in low stress livestock handling, we confuse speed or life with stress. Does that make sense? So, oh, we gotta go slow, we gotta go slow. And, and now we go the other way where they get dull and it's hard to move them to get a job down and it ends up being way more stressful because you cannot move that unbalanced life to direction ratio to move the animal to ultimately go get a job. Okay, so the temperament of livestock can help or hindering our handling process. 
So one of the things Chris and I did was we took the, the same uh, uh, temperament, the score sheets that we do with horses, and we did a little pamphlet that we could give the cattle producers to help them score their cows just like you'd score a horse on these different deals. And so on here, there's six different tem temperament items that can be rated from one to five for individual animals or a herd as a whole. So extremes on both sides can be problematic and may need to be addressed before handling becomes possible. So this is something as a cattle producer, you can go out there and you can track yourself just like the training trifecta and working with horses. So we have confidence. High confidence animals are willing to do difficult tasks and adequately respond to the handler's request. These animals often will lead the herd. Animals with low confidence are hesitant in unfamiliar situations and may seek to evade rather than confront challenges. Situations such as turning back at the gate or locking up in a raceway can be signs of low confidence animals. So there's some examples of not having confidence uh, or having it or not having it. Uh, Self-preservation. Animals with high self-preservation are solely looking to protect themselves from any external factors. These animals will exhibit strong flight characteristics when in open areas and aggressively push to the center of the bunch when they are not able to evade by flight. Animals with low self-preservation have no concerns from outside influences. These animals can be approached easily and maintain a calm demeanor. And so we're talking, as we're looking at the pyramid there, they're, they're opposite, right? As confidence goes up, self-preservation goes down and, and vice versa, right? Uh, so sensitivity. Uh, sensitive animals re respond and move off pressure quickly and are quick to respond to the subtleties in the handler's movements. Low sensitive animals are less inclined to respond to the handler's subtleties. So here's the key, especially in some of the low stress livestock cats, like, oh, low stress, low stress. Well, pretty quick, we've totally desensitized these animals. That'd be like trying to get a job done on a horse, and I've numbed and dumbed this horse down to the opponent like a circus pony, where, where I can't even get this horse to move to go anywhere, right? And so I'm trying to get a job, and it's tons of stress because I can't get them to move to go do anything, especially in the Great Basin where we need to take these cows and we need to get them lined out to get them to go because we got 20, 30 miles we got to cover in a day or whatever, you know what I mean? And some of those would be extremes or whatever, but there's sometimes you got a long ways to go, okay? And that would, you know, in, in getting the job done. Okay, energy. High energy animals are willing and wanting to move out. When asked to move by the handler, high energy animals will do such at a higher rate of speed. Low energy animals will be slow and sluggish when asked to move and may prefer to stand or graze in one location instead of moving as requested. And so that comes back to we want the energy, we want the life, we want to be able to pick them up to abide the pressure, give them the relief where they're going. And I think that's the big difference sometimes between training your cows in the low stress livestock handling to place cows versus a little bit in the Great Basin picking up your cows and moving them from one direction to the other. Now Chris and I have worked with this quite a bit and, and I think there could be a guy could obviously have both. You can pick them up, you can move them, um, but a little bit of the methods in how you ask that cow to move is a little bit different. So an example in the low stress livestock handling, they were saying they want constant pressure and when you quit applying the pressure, you back off and they should stop. So that's like, in my mind, kicking a horse every step, and when you quit kicking him, right, he stops. I, I want my cows, I want to apply pressure, and then once they leave, to back off and give them relief so I'm not kicking them every step. So that would be like riding a horse, I don't want to kick him every step. If he's not moving, I'm going to spank him, I'm going to get him to go, and then I'll back off and I'll give him relief. So that's that willing submission component where they're doing it on their own. So those are those those slight differences that Chris and I are still working with to go, okay, here's stockmanship. Now, how would that apply to placing cows or moving cows or clearly defined stockmanship? But then really what we've come up with is it might be a little bit different in placing cows. You can have a well-trained herd for placing cows that would be, say, like Western Pleasure. And then you can train horses with a little bit more of the Great Basin style where it's a little bit more like a reigning cow horse, you know. And the big thing at the end of the day while we're identifying stockmanship is are your cows trained and that's what I'm going through here. This is the checklist 
whether it's the, like a horse, the foundation on a horse is the foundation on a horse, and if they have that solid foundation, you should be able to specialize in, in either area, okay? So willingness and response to a request. Willing animals are quick to respond to a request and are alert to the subtleties of the handler's movements. Unwilling animals will either disregard the handler's request or seek to evade any pressure applied by the handlers. And so uh, that's really key there as far as that pressure and relief. Um, in, in Like that's what I was just talking about, willing where we set it up to where it's their idea, right? There's pressure and there's relief. I honestly feel like whether that was the applied animal behavior, horses, cows, dogs, people, kids, all of that of pressure and relief when they're doing their job, give them the relief. That's one of the driving factors there is that relief and we need to meet that or comfort. Okay, so willingness to stay in a herd. Willing animals will either be directly within the herd or on the fringes but following along in the same direction and playing. These animals will be calm and comfortable when being and working within the herd. Unwilling animals will appear uncomfortable when being forced to stay in a herd and always seek to evade the herd. These animals will be seen on the fringes in the pasture and likely try to slip out of sight as handlers are seen. So one of the things we'll get in here, whether it's Great Basin stockmanship in holding roe deer. thing with Great Basin stockmanship, the cows are always scattered. We go out and gather them and then we work out of the roe deer a lot. The low stress livestock handling, we're placing our cows so they're always in a bunch. Either one, we need to train them to where they come together in a bunch and they are quiet and they are soft so we can either sort out of the roe deer whether we can place cows, either one, so that's, that's applicable there. So in order to be able to effectively accomplish the task completion of a given animal or herd of animals, we need to be able to direct their thoughts in the direction we want. Okay, so this, we went through temperament, now I'm going through foundation. Temperament has to do with their emotion, okay? Uh, foundation has to do with their mind, okay? So what is the animal thinking? Can I influence, which would be direct or redirect their thoughts in a certain direction? So that's that foundational part, just like working with our horses. I want to be able to take the slack out of the rein and have them give. I'm directing that horse's thoughts. I need to be able to direct that cow's thoughts, okay? Um, so below are some basic foundational principles that a person should be able to do with individual animals in the entire herd. These basic maneuvers are like getting a colt giving in the round pen foundation before trying to ride them away from the barn, task completion. And so these are some of the things, like if I was gonna get on a colt, I'd get them to tip their nose, disengage their hindquarters. That enables me to point that horse in a direction, getting them to leave the barn. And so these are some of the things that whether you're working with the horse in a krill or all, these things is what I make sure I have established in getting a horse to work out of, a, I'm getting a cow to work out of a roe deer, to sort them out of a roe deer. I'll get them given before I actually get them out and try to drive them away. And so these are these basic foundational things. So uh, one of the things is move straight forward when pressured to the side or the rear. So you can see a guy coming in right here. Um, and as a handler moves toward the animal herd perpendicular from the side of the animal, the animal will move straight forward with good movement. Changing the angle of the pressure can alter the severity of the pressure applied. As handlers move in straight lines behind the herd, uh, will move perpendicular from the pressure. So I guess that's not exactly the picture I was looking for. What we're looking for is move straight forward pressure to the side or the rear. So I could come to the side to get them to move, or what they're talking about is being perpendicular from the pressure. So if I want these cows to go straight, I'm gonna work back and forth here to get them to line out to go straight instead of being right straight behind those cows, okay? Uh, so turn left and right when pressured toward the head. And that was some of the stuff, the basic uh, fundamental things that, that they broke down in the low stress livestock handling PowerPoint we looked at. So the animal is willing to turn right or left when direct pressure is applied ahead of the shoulder or by the handler moving away from the animal opposite of the desired direction. So, okay, so turn. So this is one of the things in our competition that we do, right? We'll come up roughly around the shoulder or the eye. We'll come right up. What point is that? If I want that animal to turn away from me, where do I need to be to do that? I need to come in the flight zone. That's the bubble. Where balance point? I need to be right on the balance point. Where is the balance point? Typically 
on the shoulder, but it changes for everything. What changes? So, so typically on the shoulder, maybe the eye, it changes. Why does it change? Part of that, guys, is what's drawing the cow. So say I put a cow out there and there's a draw getting back to the herd. The balance point, here's how I think about it. The balance point is the point that I deny them access to get back to the herd. So I could be, say that the cow's standing right here, say the cow's this chair, I could be standing right here at the eye, but if the herd's over there, they can see a direct line of sight to the eye. So their eye may be right there, I may clear be behind the shoulder to deny, deny them access where they can see where they can turn to get back there. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, turn left and right when pressured to the hip. Okay, so that's this picture here. And you guys remember, uh, well, we watched a video of that the other day where you can come right straight behind him or kind of on the hip, not straight behind him, toward the hip, just like getting a, ca a horse to turn and face you, right? You put a little pressure, and as they start to turn the face, you just back off. So you can put pressure on a hip. If you're coming just almost behind him but a little bit off, that cow will be a little bit unsure, and they'll turn around so they can see you. Does that make sense? Uh... Start or speed up as the handler moves from the head to the tail. So as the handler moves from the front to the rear of the animal, it will start moving forward or speed up as the handler passes the shoulder. So the cows are going this way, we want to go the opposite direction. Cows are going this way, we want to go the opposite direction to speed up those animals. Okay? If I go the same direction, I'm going to slow down that herd. So that's really important when we get cows lined out, like we're going up in Jordan Valley, if I want to speed them up, I want to come up and I'm going to ride the opposite direction. If I want to slow them down, I'm going to go up the same direction to stop them. Okay? Okay, task completion. Okay, so we talked about temperament. We talked about foundation. Here's the task completion or the will. Okay, we talked about the mind, the will, and the emotion. Task completion, temperament, foundation. Okay, so what does the animal want? So where are they seeking comfort and companionship? So here's the question. Can I influence their thoughts and emotions to move their feet where I want them to go? Well, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do with working cows, right? We're working the horses. We're trying to influence their will to move their body, whether it's a horse or a cow or even a person, right, to get them to do what we want them to do. So the question is, can I influence their thoughts and emotions to move their feet to get them to do what I want to do? So they're based there. Uh, Honestly, there's a lot of different things that we do with cows. I honestly think these four things is the basis of everything we do with cows, especially in the Great Basin. These four things, it's like stage one, two, three, four with our horses, right? Once I have those four things, that's a foundation where I can pretty much do an entire reigning cow horse foundation. I can build on that to get that horse to do about anything I want him to do. I feel like these four things here are the must four things that you should have with the horse, okay, or with your cows. So the first one is gather. So as the handler begin to pick up livestock to move them, livestock quietly and calmly come together into one herd. So Great Basin, cows are scattered. In the Great Basin, our cows are trained. We go out, we put a little bit of pressure on them, they come together. Like they know the drill, they're scattered, they come together. Does that make sense? They, they find comfort in the herd. They know that's where they're at. And as we go out, that's part of the deal to recognize as employees, where are we at? What are we doing? Well, we're in the gather part here, okay? And I'll explain that more in a little bit. So place or hold roe deer. Uh, so take all the movement out of the animal or herd, and they stay in a relative area they are placed. Be able to keep livestock in one location with relative ease while sorting out individuals or performing other tasks required. Animals remain calm and quiet during the entire process. So th this is key, like up at Jordan Valley, we do that right. We gather, we need a hold row deer, we'll gather a field, we got the neighbor's cows, we got this old um, you know, cow that's, that's uh, got to leave this, whatever, this young pair here, we got this cow that's her body condition score is too low we don't want to take her to the mountain and we got these you know uh foot rot bull that we want to leave so we need to sort out these so a lot of times we'll gather we'll hold the roe deer we'll sort out the ones that we want and then we'll go ahead and, and we'll take all the rest of them so one way you could do that um you can do that two different ways you can be all scattered out and you can try to sort them out sometimes if you have green people 
and the cows aren't wanting to stay sorted, sometimes it's easier to hold roe deer like we do at Greeley's with a bunch of green people and green horses and cows that um, aren't wanting to leave, that keep coming back to just hold roe deer kind of by the gate. You kick out everything that you don't want and then you take what, what you do want, okay? Mm -hmm. um, they were just all in that big, yeah. like, valley. Yep. I no. was so weird. I did not know what was going on. I was like, well, and that's partly why we're going through so you know, okay, we're in the gather. Now we're holding our deer, and that's the practical application in this sport of getting that cow to turn in and away from you. I mean, all this stuff that I teach has a practical application for us going to Jordan Valley, which the purpose of that is to give you guys the skills someday if you wanted to make 100, 150 bucks for, for day work to have those skills, okay? So here's the other part, seeking, seek an opening when pressure is applied. So when the handler applies pressure, the animals seek for an opening or direction in which release can be found. This could be a gate, a chute, a raceway, a trailer, or general direction in the pasture. The focus should be that the animal is actively looking for the opening the handler is offered. Conversely, the handler needs to make sure there is an opening for the animal, animal to release the pressure from with minimal effort. That's one of the things that I remember growing up is give them a hole. You have to give them a hole. Pressure relief. I don't care if it's working with horses, working with cows. And so that's that part right here where especially working out of a deer, pressure, pressure, pressure. When their thought starts to leave, we need to give them relief. Um, one of the things my dad used to say all the time is we want them to think they're escaping in the direction we want them to go. A lot of times we go to force them, uh, they're seeking the comfort in the companionship of the herd. Okay, So we put discomfort on them to leave the herd, well now it's uncomfortable they're going to seek the herd. Where if I come up there and they're wanting to stay with the herd, they're seeking comfort in the companionship and I make it uncomfortable when they're in the herd, and as soon as their thought leaves, I back off and I give them comfort. Pretty quick, they'll, they'll let go of their primary driving factor of companionship and they'll seek comfort away from the herd. So that's just the science behind sorting cows out of a roe deer. But so many times, it isn't like pressure and relief of getting them to go. The, the funny part is, if you're consistent with this with your cows where there's consistent pressure, the first time you ever load a horse in the trailer, right? They're a little bit unsure, a little bit unsure. You kind of help them to put pressure. Pretty quick, they just hop up because they learn it's easier to hop in the trailer. If you start from the scratch and you teach your cows that when you're loading and all, and you let them figure it out pretty quick, a little bit of pressure, relief, they learn to do it, and that's the whole low stress, willing submission, all of those different things. It's always easier, okay? Uh, trail with good movement. Once the livestock are gathered and asked to go somewhere, animals line out and travel unrestricted. Good movement is defined as movement with, uh, which attracts others to follow. Again, minimal effort should be needed to maintain the movement. So part of this is that I want to gather, we hold, all of this should be like I apply pressure with my horse. When he starts to do stage four, I give him relief. Right? If he goes away, I ask him again, he starts to do stage four, I give him relief. Pretty quick that horse is doing, he, he's spinning on a loose rein. All of these four stages, I want the same thing. I apply a little pressure, they start to gather, I give them relief. Then pretty quick these cows are doing what you want them to do, just like, just like I want my horse to be in between my hands and feet, we can train our cows where they're in between flight zone and balance point and they're doing what we want to do because they know their job because they're good employees. I feel like that's part of what I'm trying to do with you guys is to educate you guys so that you guys understand so the horses, the dogs, the kids, the cat, like everyone's on the same page as far as what we're doing. Does that make sense? Some basic principles. So principles are the natural tendencies livestock have which can be utilized to be more effective in communication. Um, adherence to these principles will improve the communication between the handler and the livestock. The livestock will respond better to the handler's request and increase in the confidence and willingness. And in, in the pamphlet, I won't go through that, but in this little pamphlet, it breaks down flight zone and balance point. We got the flight zone all the way around here. This shows the blind spot. It has the, the balance point, the pressure point. It has all those different different deals there. But uh, I'll give that on, on, the, on the handout. I'm not gonna go through that right now, but here's some just basic principles. 
Livestock will always do what they have been conditioned and trained to do, good or bad. Okay, and I think that's, as an employer, I think that's part of training. This is why I'm going through this, is training. Training kids, training horses, training dogs, training employees. Uh, livestock learn from the release of pressure, not the application. I mean, all this stuff is applicable, right? Think of a coach. Think of your, your good coaches that you've had or teachers or whatever. Um, livestock want to move in the direction they are headed. Livestock want to follow other animals. Livestock want to see what is pressuring them. Livestock want to see where you want them to go. And so some of those things are so key. Like if I need to give them time to look so they have confidence if I'm trying to drive them through a gate. I don't want to be straight behind them if I'm trying to drive these cows. And that other picture, the, the cowboys were behind them. That wasn't as big a deal because there's pressure in the leaf that the cows were, were lined out. So normally you don't want to be straight behind one cow as you're moving them because they can't see you. They, they want to see you, okay, and so that's better to pressure them off to the side. Um, livestock want to see where you want them to go. Livestock prefer handlers move in straight lines. Livestock naturally move perpendicular to the pressure. So like if I have a bunch of cows scattered out here, Okay, and sometimes what happens is people come right in the middle here. They come right in the middle to push these cows. A lot of times what happens to these cows? They scatter. they scatter like this. So then I'm running back and forth and back and forth, clear over here. What's funny is if I say these cows are here, and this is where you can really do a lot of training. If you just start right here and you come over here and stop, do a good vertical direction in stage two, roll over your hocks, Stage four, come back over here. These cows are going to see you. If they come out right here, these cows are going to see you, and what are they going to go? What are they going to go? They're going to go back that way. And then I trot over here. These cows are going to go that way. Pretty quick, these cows are going to line out and go, ex it's crazy to play, play with this sometime. They will go perpendicular to the pressure. Wherever your straight line is, they will go exactly, it's amazing the science behind that perpendicular to where you're going. Instead of coming up in the middle, ah, sick the dogs or run, I mean just start going back and forth on that. To start cows, I mainly, I mean, I'm not a dog guy, but I mainly use my dogs when they are going to get the outliers. They're not to get things moving. You get things moving from the drag with dogs, them cows want to turn around, they get to fight. And they, I mean, that's, in my mind, not a good way to, to use dogs is to come right straight behind them and sick the dogs on them, okay? Uh, livestock naturally move perpendicular pressure. We primary direct a horse through rein and leg pressure. We primary direct a cow through flight zone and balance point. So that was my own little deal there. That's Now, when you're directing an entire herd, sometimes that changes, but the simple way of thinking about it in directing one cow or even a group is flight zone and balance point. Horse, reins and feet, cow, flight zone and balance point. Okay, so here we go. The day work, field trip rules. Okay, so here's what I, uh, so I, I cannot wait. I am going to go around, oh you have your card. I am going to interview, I have 10 people lined out, we'll see if I can get to them. 10 different people that have done day work, that have hired day workers. I have 10 different questions that I'm going to interview these people in relation to this stuff. And so, just their own take on it. So guys, this is some of the stuff, here's my day work rules, okay? Uh, I structure all of my classes, I structure them like you're working for me, right? We're starting a cult. The expectations is to meet the TQA, um, you know, the, get those 15 things in two months. Uh, the second year, it's like, okay, we're trying to get these horses to sell for 75, 20,000, getting them ready for the show. Day work, okay, here's the expectations. You guys are working for me. Here's what I would expect. So some keys to success, and this is applicable anywhere especially with you guys in a college setting, or really, like as a dad, as I get my kids get older and I take them up there, is one of the things is be safe, okay? Uh, you know, the days of doing the cowboy thing and going for a bronc ride, not that guys still can't do that, but even in being a bronc rider for, for, from my teens clear into my 30s, there's opportunities that you can practice some skills there. And, but with that said, 
A guy needs to know when to do that. There's some times where it's like, instead of having some horsemanship skills to help him do that, like when it's icy and it's muddy, and it's one thing to have a horse that's kind of a little bit humpy and you push him through it, and it's, it's another deal to have a horse that's dangerous and he's counterfeit and you haven't worked through all those issues and you're out by yourself and he goes to bucking and falls down in some rocks and now he's up on top of you. I mean, that's a totally, those counterfeit horses that you didn't take the time to train them right to begin with, those are the ones that I feel like are can be extremely dangerous. I was visiting with a guy in Nevada and he goes, yeah, he remembered when he went and they were, you know, ah, be a bronc rider and do all that and they started the day and four of them all went for bronc rides and two of the horses slipped and fell and broke their leg and they were they were down, and maybe there's three of them and they're down, maybe there's five of them, they were down three guys and there's two guys left to go do their job. The other two went to the hospital with broken legs or hurt bones because the horses had bucked and slipped and fall because it was during the winter and it was slick. You know, and so those are the things, be safe. Okay, part of that, you know, on the simple, is your tack. Make sure you have the right tack you need. Okay, make sure uh, equipment and supplies, um, one thing like going up there, the right clothes. Some of you kids, we go up there and it's like, good, you didn't bring gloves? Really? I mean, and that's one of the things where you're going, like we're here and we go to Jordan Valley, that's a higher altitude. One rule of thumb, you can always take clothes off, okay? And so, uh, rather have uh, too much clothes than, than not enough. Uh, different places, like I don't know why in the Great Basin they don't tie it's a buckaroo. That's funny. You get to different places where I'm a buckaroo and I don't tie my coat on the back of them. And there's different places. And so I don't know. There's nowhere like that has more tradition than the Great Basin of what you do and don't do. And some of the stuff is, some of the stuff makes sense and I love it. Some of the stuff's like, oh my gosh, give, give me a break, you know. But like a little kid can't tie his jacket on the back of a saddle or whatever. So uh, know your team and watch out for them. Uh, so that's a big part of being safe. And that goes right into the productive part. Okay, so right when we go out there, when we show up, what's the first thing we do generally? When we have, when there's a bunch of cows out there, what's the first thing we do? Gather. gather. Okay, so line out a plan. So the first thing we're going to do is gather. Cows are scattered, we're going to gather. So these go, all of these go together. So know your team, be productive, be productive, know your team. And so when I get there, I want to be productive. So if we're going to gather, I mean, Jordan Valley is some big country over there. Some of those, you know, they're 150,000 acres. I mean, some of those are big country that we're trying to gather, okay? Those pastures aren't that big. I guess in Nevada, a bunch of those pastures, I mean, they were, they were huge pastures, some of those. And so one of the things is you go out there, I mean, there'll be country where there's a hill here. I, you need to be able to see the guy on the left and the right of you. What I'm saying here, partly, and when you gather... You'll get there, and then the cow boss will drop people off. They'll go, okay, you go here, you go here, especially if you're going around cows. You'll drop people off, and the guy with the, you, you know, I remember I always liked to be on the out circle. I always had tough horses or horses with a lot of energy. I love to go do day work and ride them to the dirt. Give me the outside circle, so I'm going to cover the most country. You drop off your little kids or the people with slow horses here. These guys, you're going this big old circle. These guys are going to be the slowest. These guys are going to be the fastest, okay? As far as getting, they're going to have the faster horses because they have the most distance to cover. But you need to stay in line to where you're going like this, and you're getting everything gathered and coming together to where everything is together, so then you could either hold roe deer and sort out or trail. Does that make sense? So what does that mean if I'm gathering and we're trying to be in line to where, number one, we're gathering everything and we're coming together. So what do you need to do sometimes? Good. I, need, I may need to go jump on a hill to make sure I'm on one draw, that guy's on another draw. We don't have cows on top of the hill. So I may need to go jump up on the hill, make sure I can see that guy, make sure there's no cows in between us. So that's part of the productive part. That's part of the know your team part. That's the other part of, gosh dang, I haven't seen Jaden in a long time. I know she's supposed to be over there. There's her cows. I mean, especially if you're with a greener crew or someone that's on a green horse, it's like, I haven't seen Jaden in a long time. You know, you're looking and looking and then pretty quick, you know, especially us going up there with green kids in green horses in a college setting, you go, okay, wait a minute, I better go, you know, see see where, where Jaden is. And most of the time, I don't get worried. I I mean, generally, they, they show up, but that's, you should be looking for them, you know, that kind of stuff. They could, a horse fell down, and they could be in a ditch, or that, that's just one of the things that we need to be aware of up there. And like me, my, I, the dad, I'm gonna line out my kids and go, I need to make sure my kids are still on both sides. So then that way I can be safe and productive. Uh, 
Next one, know your assignment. If you don't know your assignment, what should you do? Ask questions. Ask questions. Okay, what am I supposed to be doing? Okay, uh, some guys are kind of jerks and they don't tell you very good. Most people do. I mean, most people, okay, hey, what do I need to be doing? I appreciate your guys' question. Hey, what do I need to be doing? They love to go up with someone. And so if you're getting day work, I highly recommend anytime you're working around someone, say, hey, is there something you see I can be doing different? People will bend over backwards. One of the things is humility, that wanting to learn versus pride, thinking you know it all. You know, um, that, that'll slow you down a little bit. Uh, so know your assignment, know slash read the play. Remember I talked about read the play, pay attention. Okay, we're holding roe deer. I shouldn't have to tell you, you know, okay, we gathered, we're holding roe deer. You are guarding that spot. I shouldn't have to tell you, you should kind of, here, we're sorting out the pairs, okay? We have the bar you are, that's our brand. Okay, so anything that is not bar you are is the neighbor's cows. We're short, I shouldn't have to tell you every cow we're shorting out. Does that make sense? You should be reading. You should be stepping in there and watching your area. Okay, so no, read the play. I will say this. Sometimes there's audibles, okay? At the end of the day, what's nice to know is the big picture. Okay, here's what we're doing. Sometimes you line it out and it's like, here's what we're doing. Everything goes haywire. It's a total disaster. Sometimes it's nice to know, like picture on a football field. It's like, okay, we're going to have a team huddle. Here's what we're doing. I'm the quarterback. I have the ball. You're the lineman. I'm going to hand it to you. You're going to run over there. Okay, we're going to score. We're going to do a sweep over here. We're going to get the ball in the end zone. Okay, you hand the ball. Go over here. Ah! defensive guy they're running back what's the goal we're still trying to get the ball to the end zone right this guy well the plan was you were going to run he's running over there now you're the blocker block adapt change you know and so that's some of the goals is it's like we're getting the cow into the corral i mean some of the times it's like read the play think a little bit as far as what the big picture is okay uh the other thing is hustle slow is fast and fast is slow a lot of time so learn, and this is where the time factor comes in, learn to read when to slow down and when to speed up, okay? So those are the productive part. The last part is have fun. I enjoy working cows. I enjoy training horses. I enjoy all of that more than anything. It's my favorite thing to do. There isn't a disconnect between, like some people, they sit in a desk and they make money and then they go ski. That's what they enjoy to do. I'm so blessed what I enjoy doing is what I get paid to do. I mean, that's I thoroughly enjoy doing what I do. That's fun for me, working cows, working on my horsemanship, stockmanship, roping. And it just so happens that's how our families made our living as well. So it is fun, but if, if it's not safe and it's not productive, it's not fun. I mean, you get out there and you're supposed to get a job done and this guy got bucked off and knocked out and you got it slows down production and you know or if you get bucked off and it's like gosh you got a broken leg or it just sucks right it sucks if when it's not safe the other thing I don't have fun when you go out there and you have a bunch of people that aren't paying attention they're not doing their job and you're unproductive that's not fun for me if you're not safe you're not productive I'm not having any fun Wade gets to be kind of in a bad attitude right okay sometimes okay in that part of the bad attitude sometimes have perspective what is your primary driving factor so that's part of having fun is i could just i i get in my self-preservation pretty quick i'm fighting with my horse and i'm yelling over here and whew, sometimes you just need to do woo saw take a deep breath what is my primary driving factor if you're in your self-preservation if a horse is in their self-preservation can they experience comfort and companionship no they're not having any comfort and the, when people get in their shot, when you get, you can kiss comfort and companionship, but you're not comfortable, and then you're going to start arguing and fighting with people, right? And so one of those things, as crappy as the day is, horrible day, this is the worst day of, really? Really? This is the worst day of your life. Cows are scat, really? Do you have four limbs? There's people that have lost both their legs. I mean, you have your health, you have a wife, a kid, you know, I mean, you have those, really, you have family, you have a roof over your head. My car sucks. Yeah, but you, we're so blessed. Does that kind of make sense? Get some perspective. I don't care how bad your day is. You don't have to look very far somewhere, especially other parts of the world, to find someone somewhere that has it worse than you. So I think that's one of the things is get some perspective. As crappy as your day is, as, as bad as it went, find a place of getting perspective. The other thing is be positive. Uh, 
Life and death are in the power of the tongue. That is so... I, I showed a picture of, of uh, Ty Van Norman and his brother Troy Van Norman. He was the most positive person on the planet. He was just... He was handy. He was productive. But he was just fun. He was fun to be around. Sometimes I get so serious and I'm training horses and I'm, I get so introverted. It's like, wait, you need to just relax. You need to relax, have fun. Such a huge part, part of that, of life and death is in the power of the tongue, is what you speak. Does that kind of make sense? Negative people create a negative environment. You guys ever been around negative people? Creates a negative environment and it sucks, right? One person gets in their self-preservation, I guarantee you it will push everyone else in their self-preservation, okay? So, uh, the other one, problems, okay? How do you handle problems, okay? I love this analogy. You guys in your life are going to be trotting along and you're going to come upon a problem, okay? Every problem that you come to in your life, okay, you are holding two different buckets in your hand. You're either holding water and you can throw some water on that problem and have it go away, or you can have gasoline. You can throw, you come across a problem, someone's around their self-preservation bickering, let's throw some fire. How can we throw more, more fire on this? And I think that's one of the things as an employee Er, that has had employees, you can have a guy that's extremely qualified that does a good job, but they're in their self-preservation. They throw gas on, it could be a tiny little problem, tiny little problem. Enters jackass number one, and then it's like, you know, it's like, there was this tiny little fire, and then this guy showed up, and just the way he runs, in his attitude, the entire working environment changed from being positive to negative to resentful and pissy, and it's just like, so that's back to the applied animal behavior and livestock skills, right? This is the last slide. These are the unwritten cowboy rules, okay? Uh, there's a picture of my dad. This is the, the biggest influence in my life is this is how I was raised. As I went through, I'm so looking forward to interviewing different people and say, okay, what are your top 10 unwritten cowboy rules? And I, I had my dad and... and and he has a bunch of different things as far as higher employees, but as far as some rules that I'd like you guys to know, that if you show up somewhere on a ranch and you don't know these things, sometimes you show up and you do one little thing that, that you shouldn't do. Like, that's bad etiquette. That's bad cow. You just, you don't do that, right? And then you do two things, three things, and you don't even know you're doing it. And then pretty quick, your employer flies off the handle and chews you out, and you're like, what? I didn't even do anything. It was all morning you'd been doing stuff that had been making a mad, and then finally they flew off the handle on you. So here's, here they are. Okay, rule number one. I love rule number one. No whiny. Oh my gosh, whiners. Some people just, they're hardwired to whine. They just constantly whine. That's how they roll. Problem, whine, whine, whine. Oh my gosh, no whining. Quit whining. Quit being a whiner. Okay, uh, number two. Show up to work on time, early and ready to work, being prepared. Good job. I would say you guys are awesome at this. Okay, Most of the time you guys are early and you're ready to work. I appreciate that. You guys do a really good job. Thing is, sometimes you guys always be early. Sometimes your employer, if they're late, that's okay. Sometimes things happen, gobble, 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 something comes up. That's fine. You, I mean, but you need to be there on time. So what does on time mean? Minutes before. <laughs> okay, for everyone it's different, but on time means early, and, and you, both you guys kind of said it, means ready to go. I'm ready to go. So if I say, okay, we're meet here at 6, we're, we're, we're leaving or whatever, I like to say we're leaving at 6. That's how I was raised, we're leaving at 6. So trailer's leaving at 6, you're not there. So however long that takes for you, if you have a colt, that you want to get on, that you want to move around, that's going to take a while, you may need to be there at 5 to get him caught and saddled in the morning or, or whatever, whatever you need to do if you can get up and put on your makeup or whatever, whatever you do. I don't, probably don't have makeup, but everyone takes, some people roll out of bed, some guys drink all night and they sleep in the pickup and they wake up and they're there, right? So I know guys that have done that too. So basically how much time do you need to have in the morning to, to oh, so many cowboys that have done that, to be ready in the morning, right? And so show up to work on time, early, ready to work, prepared, having all your stuff ready to go. Uh, number three, own your mistakes, learn from them, and try not to pe repeat them. That was one of my dad's biggest pet peeves. Own your mistakes. Hey, Jaden, or hey, Kelsey, I'll pick on Kelsey. I pick on you. Hey, Kelsey, when you, yeah, but I thought blah, blah, blah. Oh, just, okay, okay, all right. 
thank you, you know. But that wasn't my fault. It was, okay, all right. That says a lot for your integrity. It just own it. Okay, sometimes it wasn't even you. It's like, okay, all right. I'll, I think that says so much for someone's character when they can just own their mistakes. As I like, okay, my bad. Okay, I think that is a sign of a really, really good leader. And if I was employer, look, I want that person that's going to say, hey, I'll own that. You know, they, ah, okay, that's a good leader. Does that make sense? Okay, I should have had that. It was really their fault. Hey, I was there. I could have done something. Not, not good leaders are constantly, it's their fault. And it was their fault. And it was their fault. And it was their fault. Did you, were you in the environment anywhere? Yeah. Okay, you, I'll, I'll own it. There's something I could have done to help change something. I'm going to own that. I could have been there. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, own your mistakes, learn from them, try not to repeat them. The next one, don't make the crew wait. If they are, run. This is how I was raised. This is probably my number one single greatest pet peeve right there. How I was raised, we run. We did sports and we were on a sports crew and we just, you run. You were part of a crew and you moved. Here's the equivalent. I know this is a little graphic, but I, I think it gets the point across. In most cultures, if I was sitting on this chair, maybe having some dinner or drinking a cup of coffee, and someone walked in the room, sat on my lap, and just farted, just ripped a big old fart, and then like walked off, I'd be like, dude, what? Why did you just fart on my leg? We don't, we don't do that. What? What, what was that about? Like that's how. Like why? Why are you not running? The crew is waiting. Why are you sitting there, slow, well, Freddie? I chewed his butt. The crew is waiting. Like we are waiting, and you are run. Like I cannot tell you how many times I got my butt chewed. Here's what my dad said. Growing up, he said, "Someone always has to be last, but it better not always be you." Okay. I mean, sometimes you're last. That's just, but you better not be last the next time. Okay. So that's a big one. Don't make the crew wait. That's my sing single greatest pet peeve right there. Uh, another big one is don't ride off when someone is getting on. Okay, that's really rude if someone's getting on. Partly it's just rude. Partly you're getting on a colt or whatever. The other thing that kind of varies is the whole gate thing. Sometimes you're pushing cows through a gate. You come up there. Sometimes some Great Basin guys and like you, everyone stays right at the gate until you know until all the cows are through and everyone stays there. You shut the gate, then everyone rides off. Some people do that. Some people are like, okay, obviously this guy needs to get the gate. One or two people need to stay here to wait for them. The other guys, if you have, you know, a thousand head of cows lined out, the leaders can go ahead and go through and, and get lined out to make sure they're lining out. That makes more sense to me, right? So some of those things, it kind of depends. Another one that's not necessarily on there, but you don't trot home. You don't lope home. Okay, so you don't lope home. My dad was with this guy one time, and they were like, five, ten miles away from camp, and they still had to trot back. Dad started trotting back, and the guy's like, nope, you don't trot home. Okay, yeah, like that last, whatever, 500 yards, I mean, wh whatever that is, you know, yeah, you don't want to get your horse get in the habit of, but we're, we're a long ways away from home. I'm going to trot home, and then basically, I the rule of thumb is once they can see home, once you can see the trailer, you know, then I like to walk my horse. But some of those things, there's rules, but it's like, jeez, I mean, the, the balance of what that is, right? So, uh, don't ride off when someone is getting on. Don't ride in front of someone or ahead of the boss. That's another one, riding in front of someone, cutting them off. Okay, that's a big thing. Part of that is your circle. If this is your circle, stay in your circle. Don't ride in front of people. Don't cut. That is your circle. Okay, does that make sense? That's another big part there. Get your butt chewed. You get a little bit of that in Nevada? No, not so much. Okay, some paces are more. Me, I try to get you guys lined out. I teach it here. Bottom line, at the end of the day, I go up there and sometimes to get the job done, someone's not doing their job. I ride over there and try to keep things going just to make sure stuff's going smooth. But in the real world, everyone should, you should have your spot and you should stay in your spot all day long. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, on your position of where you are. So that's part of not riding in front of someone, riding on someone else's circle. Uh, don't touch another man's wife or dog. Okay, uh, you can go the other way. Don't touch another woman's dog or husband. Okay, that's one of the things like in outside of ranching cultures, dogs are like pets. Oh, puppy, puppy, puppy. Like in, in the ranching world, the dog, like that's that guy's dog. Like he's his master. He goes use him. That's his tool. So you don't, like we grew up, you don't touch another guy's dog. And sometimes people anymore, 
it's not as big a deal, but still that's part of the etiquette. Like my son, I have my son, I take my hat off when I shake a girl's hand. That's part of the I'll go down here, a gentleman and a lady. That's just part of the etiquette is I mean, you don't touch another guy's dog. That's their dog. That's um, anyway, and so that's how I grew up. The other thing is keep your dog with you. Okay? The other thing, being raised in the great ba being raised, if your dog they can get shocked. Keep your dog with you. Don't be surprised if he's chasing the neighbor's stock and he gets shot. That's what happens. One of my biggest pet in the world. <laughs> oh, it's you too. Okay. Keep your dog with you. Your dog should not be... That's your dog. I feel like that should apply to here too. Big time. Yes, I agree. I agree. There's a, stock, there's a livestock center rule. There shouldn't be any dogs unless it's on the stock horse team. That is the rule that's not enforced at the livestock center. But yeah. Uh, here's another one that I was raised with. Clean your plate. Don't complain about the food and thank the cook. I hate tomatoes. I'm better now. But I remember younger eating them and there'd be the tomatoes and I'd be like, I'd just swallow. I mean, it's just, but that's what you did. You clean your plate. You clean your plate. You don't, like kids, a lot of times they go, they'll dish up and then they'll walk up there and they'll throw away a plate full of food. You want to piss off some older cowboys, throw away food. I mean, so clean your plate. Most of the time, I, just about any place, you can go back for seconds. Okay, so take what you're going to be, clean your plate, okay, don't complain about the food, okay, it may be crappy food, mmm, thank you, this sure good, thanks, and like Troy, my cousin, some, they'd help do dishes, I mean, that's, those guys were awesome, they were good about helping doing dishes and helping on the crew, and that's just how they, how they were, you know, and so, uh, part of that goes into the next one is be a gentleman and be a lady. Okay, that's one of the, back to the, I was raised, I remember when I was little, dad said, all right, here's what you do, son. You scrub, I don't go like this. I go, go like this, and you know, that's what you do when you shake a lady's hand, you know, and so, and be a lady. I've given you ladies the lady talk. Be a lady, okay? Men will treat you a lot better if you act like a lady. If you act like the non-lady, they treat you like that. If there's, I was, I am a guy. I was a guy looking at girls at one point, okay? You treat the woman that the a girl that you think is marriage material way different than a girl that you want to go have fun with with one night that is you treat them way different you look at them way different okay so you kids are all my kids okay i treat you like all that's that's the dad talk okay that's that's all i'm going to go with the dad talk uh, uh don't sit around if you're on the payroll find something to do okay that's the other one there is if you're on the payroll find something to do there's something I mean, that was, should be doing something, okay? When your employer shows up and you're sitting there because you finished the one thing, it's going to kind of piss them off. You're getting paid. I'm not paying you to find something. Well, I did your job. If you want to really impress an employer, finish what you do, and when they show up, you're cleaning something. Pretty much any ranch, I guarantee you there'd be dirt or something that needs cleaned. Clean something. Pick up some trash. Fix some fence. Do something if you're getting paid to work. Does that kind of make sense? That were, these are the things, some of these things, some of those other things, those are the things that will push you to leadership material, that will skyrocket you to be so much different than the other people. There are some of these core values that go, hey, I want to hire. There's a guy, uh, the guy that owns Treetop Ranches, great businessman. He finds people and then he creates positions. Is that crazy or what? Instead of, go have this ranch, now I need to find someone, he'll go, this is an awesome guy.